Okay, so we need to finish up kidney physiology, then we'll move right into water and ion balance. Um, so we've gone through the three mechanisms that are utilized to change the urine. We've got glomerular filtration, tubular secretion, and tubular reabsorption. In the loop of Henley, there's a lot of stuff that goes on. And this is a really, really unique and cool design that helps us to maintain or get rid of as much water as we need. So if we need water, if we need to spare water in circulation, we're going to use a certain step, uh, sequence of steps. Or if we need to get rid of excess of water, we're going to use another sequence of steps. And it really all comes down to how the tubular system interacts with vasorecta, that, that uh, capillary system that interacts with the, the loop of Henle. And this is all about maintaining and changing the medullary osmolarity, so renal medullary osmolarity. Say that five times fast. So renal medullary osmolarity. If we were to survey the fluids in all of our different fluid compartments, intracellular fluid, extracellular fluid, the blood, all of those different fluids, what we would find is that the fluid osmolarity, which remember is a reference to the water and to the ions that are diluted in that solution. So fluid osmolarity for most of our fluids is about 300 milli osmoles per liter. Okay, And you're going to see this number 300 here at the beginning of the loop of Henle. But notice by the time you get down to the bottom of the loop of Henle, it's about 1,200 milli osmoles, which indicates, as you can sort of see, that we get more and more concentrated. So we're losing water, right? This is less, this is dilute, more yellow. This is more concentrated, darker yellow. So about 300 milli osmoles, that's going to include the blood. So the filtrate comes in, and it has an osmolarity right around 300 milli osmoles. So I would propose that there are going to be certain situations where we want to generate conditions that we can increase the osmolarity of the blood to spare water and get rid of excess ions from the bloodstream. There are going to be other situations where we want to remove water and get rid of water, so we want to increase the concentration of water, thereby decreasing the ion concentration and get, it, get rid of the dilute water or the dilute urine to eliminate water from the bloodstream. So we have to manipulate that 300 milliosmoles per liter through the kidney. And this is going to happen by the actions of the renal medulla. Now, in the renal medulla, this is going to be the tissue that surrounds the nephron. So this is not the nephron tissue. This is the other parts of the kidney, the other tissue that we find in the kidney. And in simple terms, I'm just going to call that very salty. Have any of you ever eaten kidneys before? Apparently, those are uh, delicacy in some places, especially chicken kidneys. Not too interested in eating a kidney, but... The reason that people like them is because they are really, really salt. And it's because of the renal medullary tissue and all of the salt that gets built up in the medulla. So, very salty. Now we're going to use this very salty nature to balance it against the rest of the fluid that's transported through the kidney. So if you look at this figure, we're taking water and depositing it into the surrounding tissue, and then it gets picked up by the bloodstream. And this helps to maintain the blood into the vasorecta and back out of the vasorecta at 300 milliosmoles. So we're protecting and balancing the water as we move it through. However, 
we'd have to maintain that saltiness inside of the bloodstream. So we're moving a bunch of water through, but we're going to balance that out with a bunch of salts as well and maintain the saltiness of the renal medulla. And the way that we can do this is by using a system that is called a countercurrent exchanger. In biology, there's a few examples of countercurrent exchangers. Another one is in the gills of fish. It's how they can extract oxygen at super high levels from a very low oxygen level environment, such as water. But the way that this works is you can see that we have exchange from one part of the system, one tube in the system, into the other system. So there's the countercurrent exchange mechanism. And really, this is going to result in no perceptible movement. No perceptible movement of water by the time we get blood back, or the, the, the water entering, the blood entering back into the main circulation, but able to maintain the saltiness so that ions and things that, that we need to move can be moved out of the kidney or can be maintained in the nephron. I'm going to come back to all of this as we begin to talk on ion balance and uh, water balance in just a few minutes. So I'm just trying to introduce you to this concept of the countercurrent exchange mechanism. So as water enters into the loop of Henle, so this is from the glomerular capsule. It comes in at 300 milliosmoles and it is going to move through the loop of Henle and because it's so salty here in the other tissue, water just begins to move up. Because it's salty, so we want to balance out that saltiness. Water moves in to try to reduce the saltiness of the kidney. But we want to maintain that saltiness because it's important for the function of the um, uh, of the whole kidney and, and, and being able to generate the right type of urine under the conditions or due to the conditions of the organism. So just water begins to flow out and we get to a point where we have this 1200 milliosmol per liter concentration in the loop of heavy. So it's become very, very salty, very dilute on water. Water passes back in to the vasa recta and leaves through the uh, circulation of vasorecta. So the question becomes, what would happen if the kidney tissue is all salty, what would happen if we didn't have a mechanism to re-dilute the um, urine as it passes towards the collecting blood? Well, we would end up with super diluted blood and we would begin to lose ions being passed into other tissues. Now the nervous system would begin to function abnormally, the heart would begin to function abnormally, and the muscles would begin to function abnormally. If we're just constantly dumping water out and getting, letting it get picked back up, eventually we're going to get to a point where we're not going to be able to maintain the right uh, concentration of water for the individual as it passes back into the bloodstream. So, Using this countercurrent exchange system, if we didn't have this in place, we wouldn't be able to keep the kidney salty, and we wouldn't be able to move salt and water the way that we needed to when the conditions of the organism changed. So um, get down here, 1,200 milliosmoles, and then as we come back up, you can see that we actually now have sodium, potassium, and chloride pumps that begin to move salt out. Well, if the kidney is really salty, this is not going to work that way. We can't continue to put more salt into a salty environment. So we allow water to cross through, which decreases the osmolarity of the blood, which means salt can enter into the bloodstream. So rather than just salt being dumped into the, kid the tissue of the kidney, it's being cycled back into the bloodstream and is being pulled out. So constantly salt is entering into the kidney, which facilitates 
water movement in other parts of the kidney, and sodium and chloride and potassium movement in other parts of the kidney to maintain the whole thing. So that tubular secretion, tubular reabsorption, and glomerular filtration can continue to modify urine according to the condition of the organism. So if I wanted to have, and again, we're going to come back to all of this when we start talking about the, the fluid balance stuff, but if I want to get rid of a bunch of water, maybe I just drank a whole bottle of water, or maybe I drank four whole bottles of water, I'm going to want to make urine, right? Why do I want to make urine? Well, one of the reasons is blood volume is going to increase, which is going to increase blood pressure. High blood pressure is not conducive for survival. So homeostasis says we're going to bring blood pressure back down. One of the ways we can bring blood, blood pressure back down is to remove some of the water. Whenever I move water, I move salt as well. I may not want to get rid of all of the salt that I have in my bloodstream. I may need the sodium and the chloride and the potassium. So I have to set up a mechanism where I can get rid of a whole bunch of water. In order to do that, I need to have a situation set up where I have a concentration gradient that drives water from the kidney into the collecting duct or from the bloodstream into the collecting duct so that it can be excreted into the urinary bladder. So let's wrap around now and try to put everything back together and put it into terms of real physiology. Um, we're going to do a, a new lecture. We're going to start over with a new lecture, but really we're extending from the, the material that we're dealing with right now. If you want to call this something, you can call it fluid balance. And really what it comes down to is even though the urinary system is what maintains the, um, the chemistry of the blood and the water status of the blood, the blood is keeping track of the chemistry and water status of all of the other tissues, right? So all of this is sort of all connected together. So we can say about humans and other organisms that humans exist in wet conditions. And you recognize this. You've all sweated before. You've all seen urine being produced before. Right now your mouth is probably somewhat moist. Maybe your nose is a little bit dripping. And that's because you're wet. All over. You exist in these wet conditions. Humans have been referred to as bags of water. I don't think you probably should go home and use these as an endearing term for your grandma. Hey, you old bag of water. <laughs> Just a suggestion. So we exist in wet conditions where bags of water, a high percentage of your body mass is water weight. The portion of your body weight that is water is called total body water. And we can abbreviate that just simply as TBW. So total body water, again, this is going to account for an organism's water content. Now, really, it's not just as simple as we're big bags of water. I mean, when you think of a bag of water, you're thinking of a water, or a, uh, maybe a water balloon or a bag, a Walmart shopping bag filled up with water. And it's not that simple. And the reason it's not that simple is because we have some gender biases, we have some age biases, and it's not just one container. We have to compartmentalize the container. So let's start out with the sex or the gender biases. So our gender biases. Males, we have a larger body size. And so this means that our total body water is actually going to be higher. So for females, it's going to be lower. Higher males, lower in females. Now, one of the reasons, in addition to just total body size, even in relative terms, so if we take it relative to body size, all of you are smaller than me. And so we could say, oh, okay, well, 
we have less modern water, but we have smaller sizes as well. So relatively, it's the same, but actually it's not. Relatively, males still have a higher amount. So it's a true gender bias. And part of that reason, and don't take this the wrong way, it stinks when it's all girls in here. You have more adipose tissue. <laughs> Now, I'm not saying that you're fatter. <laughs> you guys are going to go down to Dr. Reynolds. You're going to be so fat today. Females have more adipose tissue. And there's some really good reasons for that. One, it helps out with structure for some of the reproductive organs. It also is going to, adipose tissue is a cushion. And during reproductive ages, you need cushion as you allow the body to expand to accommodate the growing fetus. I'm getting there. Adipose tissue is devoid of water. It's a very dry tissue relative to the other tissues. And that makes a lot of sense. Why does it make a lot of sense? Because adipose tissue consists of lipids, and lipids are hydrophobic. They don't play well with water. So why would there be a bunch of water around I'll admit I'm the fattest one in the room. Don't go down to Dr. Reynolds and tell him bad news. They're lies. <laughs> There's also an age bias at birth. About 75% of the total body weight is accounted for by the water that's present. Now, that's a lot of water, and if you've been around a maternity ward or uh, been around in uh, those types of situations, you know that most babies lose a pretty large amount of water or body weight in about the first two days. And so there's going to be some of that 75% that is at birth that's going to be excessively lost over a short amount of time, about a two-day period. So you might come home as a bundle, or you might be born in your bundle of joy, you know, and your weight is 8 pounds, 9 ounces. And then two days later, you're at like 8 pounds, 10 ounces. Young adult, which is your age. Physiologically, maybe not mature wise. Oh, hey, maybe I'm saying you're more mature. <laughs> <laughs> Young adults, around 50 to 60 percent of total body weight is is going to be water, and it just continues downhill from here. By the time we get into older age, elderly, it's about 45%. Yeah, partially that's going to account for wrinkles uh, in, in a lot of ways. Other things that begin to sag. <laughs> so just an example. A 70 kilogram adult male. So 70 kilogram would be total body weight, total body water would be about 40 liters. So we have both the gender bias and the age bias. Now, this total body water is not just one compartment. We have to compartmentalize. So it's going to be compartmentalized. And we can refer to these as body compartments, or a better term is going to be fluid compartments. And 
I mean, obviously, this is not really a great graphical representation. It's definitely not a homocular diagram by any stretch of the imagination. But this really shows the major body compartments and then the barriers that help to define the compartmentalization. Okay, so when we talk about fluid compartments, we're talking about the individual locations where we're going to have small samples of water. And each of these fluid compartments is going to be surrounded by some sort of selectively permeable membrane. So by some sort of selectively permeable membrane. The way that we look at this, and hopefully you're recognizing some of these terms. In fact, you've already seen many of these terms, and you now are maybe beginning to recognize some of the um, synonyms that I've used throughout the semester. So the, the way that we're going to break this up, we're going to say there are two major compartments. Compartments. Okay, so two major compartments, and then these two major compartments Can be further subdivided. So we'll have some subdivisional things going on here as well. Okay, so intracellular fluid. What exactly is intracellular fluid? Someone give me a definition. Okay, someone don't give me that. Intracellular fluid, where are we finding? That's what we're finding inside of the cell. Okay, so intracellular fluid compartmentalized up into all of our cells. We have fluid. We call it cytosol would be another term that we could use there. And of total body weight, this accounts for about 65%. So there is a lot of water that's trapped up inside of your cells. More than 50% of the total body water in an individual is going to be locked inside of individual cells. The second major division or major um, compartment is the extracellular fluid. And you've heard me use that term in this abbreviation of ECF. Now, what you're looking at here you can see that the extracellular fluid, in this case, is divided up into plasma, which is in the blood, and then interstitial fluid, which is what surrounds the cells. That's what we would call tissue fluid. And that's what is referred to as extracellular fluid in this figure. The permeable membranes are going to be capillary walls between interstitial and plasma, and then the cell membrane itself dividing intracellular from the extracellular fluid. In all reality, though, there's actually a third compartment that we need to identify. So you can already see the extracellular fluid. It's going to be our remaining 35%. But that 35% is actually going to be broken up into additional compartmentalization. So on the figure, we already have tissue or interstitial. And this is about 25%. And this is not 25% of the 35%. It's 65% is intracellular fluid, 25% is tissue or interstitial fluid. So I'm, I'm going to add up to 35 here, is what I'm trying to say. What else can we call tissue or interstitial fluid? Anyone else know what else I've called it or remember what else I've call, called it? What do we call it? Bone. Ground substance. Extracellular matrix, tissue fluid, interstitial fluid, those are all terms that are used to describe 
this compartment. Well, 25% of all of your body fluid is that water and fluid surrounding the tissue. And then the other one on the figure here is the blood plasma. Now, in all reality, I'm not just going to simply leave it at blood plasma. I'm also going to wrap in, what do you think I'll wrap into it? How about the lymph? The lymph is basically a type of plasma as well, and eventually it mixes back in with the blood. So if you were to take out all of the lymphatics and all of the vasculature and extract out all of the fluid, we'd be left over with blood plasma and then also our lymph. And that would account for about 8% of the total. So if you do the math there, I got two more percent that's not accounting for right now. What's not shown on this figure is a fluid compartment that's refers, referred to as transcellular fluid. This makes up the remaining 2%. Okay, we had everything up, now we're at 100%. So what exactly is transcellular fluid? Well, we've seen this with some other organ systems. Sometimes when we can't categorize things definitively, we just sort of give it this catch-all. You remember irregular bones? Irregular bones really didn't have anything unique about them. We just didn't know where else to put them. So we call it irregular bones. Transcellular fluid is the same type of thing here. Biologists, again, were really lazy and we get, oh man, it would be great to call this intercellular fluid and this interstitial fluid and this plasma. But what about this last 2%? Let's just do a catch-all. So transcellular fluid is just simply a catch-all term. So what exactly is transcellular fluid? What is this last... 2%. What are the categories that don't fit into these other three? Well, it's going to be fluid that is not tissue or plasma fluid. Okay, that's good. It's not interstitial fluid and it's not plasma. So what else is there? Well, you probably are already thinking about a, a few options here. You'll remember that the brain and the spinal cord are surrounded by a, a fluid called cerebral spinal fluid. Holy cow. So cerebral spinal fluid. In the pericardium, we have the pericardial sac and the pericardial fluid pericardial fluid is going to be this transcellular fluid. Probably pleural fluid would fit in here as well, surrounding the lungs. You might even consider some of the joint fluids, synovial fluid in this category. Urine is going to be part of the total body water. Time within the digestive fluid, or you could just simply refer to it as the digestive fluid. So the rest of this stuff, about 2%. Water that's moving through the digestive tract. Water that's emptying into the bladder. All of that will account towards, a, towards a, a water weight, but it's not intercellular fluid, it's not interstitial fluid, and it's certainly not in the bloodstream, it's not plasma. So the rest of this kind of stuff, transcellular fluid, transcellular just really simply means that it's not really in the cells, it's just kind of around the cells, but it's not in the tissue. It's incorporated into the organ or held in some organ. And that'll be our last 2%. Now, I said that uh, each of our compartments was going to be separated by a selectively permeable membrane. So let's talk a little bit about those membranes and identify some of those membranes and really detail what they're, uh, what they're going to do. The membranes, whether it's the cell membrane or the capillary wall, is the surface, surface of exchange. Surface of exchange. So you know that the capillary 
carrying blood, interacts with the capillary wall to pass fluids and gases and ions in either direction. So we have that exchange between the interstitial fluid and the plasma. And so that capillary wall is going to be one of our membranes. And then the plasma membrane in particular the plasma membrane called a cell membrane is the other point of exchange. Now there's a big difference between the capillary wall and the cell membrane. The capillary wall, even though it is selective, is typically selective off of what? Off of size. The cell membrane is typically selective off of what characteristics? Okay. Um, yeah, permeability is going to change, but is it based off of size? What's it typically based off of? What did you say? Gradients. Concentration gradients. Okay, but why does a why would a cell membrane become permeable to something? It's needed. If I need glucose, I'm going to make the cell membrane permeable to glucose. If I need to get rid of hormones, I'm going to make the cell membrane permeable to those hormones. So this is selectively permeable based off of size. Cell membrane is selectively permeable based off of the need. So when it comes down to it, the exchange that happens between capillary wall and cell membrane, it's going to be different. Most exchange, because if you if you really think about it, where is most of the most of the water that's occurring inside of the body? It's right here on either side of the cell membrane. Sixty-five percent here, twenty-five percent here, and really only twenty-five and eight percent between these two locations. So most of the exchange that's occurring is occurring through the cell membrane, which is mean, means it's driven by need. Everything else happens because of osmosis. Now that osmosis in the case of capillary wall is going to be driven by concentration gradients and size. The water movement across the cell membrane is going to be driven by need and we're going to require things like aquaphorance. So here, we just have to establish concentration gradients. Here, we have to change the physiology. Now, we talked a little bit about osmosis. I want to just show you some, some more here on, on osmosis. And sort of relate osmosis and the drive for water movement uh, related to solutes, because solutes are going to be a big player in how water actually moves. So our different compartments, and really because transcellular fluid is 2% and there's actually not a lot of exchange that occurs. I mean, you're not exchanging urine back into your blood. Once it's in the bladder, it's not coming back out. It's going to the toilet or on a tree. If you're an animal. <laughs> Poor disgusting professor on campus. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's really bad. So <laughs> what drives Osmosis. What is the impetus for osmosis? Well, it's developing a concentration gradient for water. And the way that we develop a concentration gradient for water is to take up space that could be consumed by water on one side of the barrier and not on the other side. So we use solutes and generate a solute concentration between the compartments to facilitate osmosis. So even though we're talking about movement of water, 
movement of water is not facilitated inherently. The movement of water is driven and determined by the solutes that are present. And really, not only the characteristic of the solute, but just the raw amount of that solute that's present. Because solutes are mass, and they have matter, and they take up space. And that space normally could be taken up by water. So it's actually going to be the solutes and their abundance or quantity that's going to determine the effect. So, I mean, really to begin here, it probably would be beneficial for us to begin to really think about what solutes are actually present in the human body. The most abundant solute is a category of solute called electrolytes. Now, because those electrolytes are most abundant, you better believe that they're going to have the most effect on how water begins to move between our different fluid compartments. And ultimately, what this comes down to is we're trying to regulate and maintain these fluid compartments. And it all comes back to the plasma and then the plasma's interaction with the urinary system. So what are our two most abundant solutes or electrolytes? Sodium is definitely one of them, and potassium is the other. So sodium and potassium. Now, because... Osmosis is what's driving the whole process, but osmosis is determined by the solutes that are present, and sodium and potassium are most abundant solutes. They're electrolytes, but what else are they? They're ions. Because of all of this relationship here, sodium and potassium are what are facilitating most of the osmosis drive, and so we cannot separate water balance from electrolytes. If we have an imbalance in electrolytes, we're going to have an imbalance in water. So it's inseparable. So I guess before I kind of delete everything, kind of the last point that I want to make before we move on to kind of a, a, new, a new line of thought. Water balance and electrolyte balance are inseparable. So we need to really know what's going on with the solutes, with the electrolytes, to understand what's going on with the water. So why do you traditionally make part of the like big exercise and play the to get yourself in any drink? To not drink? Sometimes it can sometimes they can come drink or electrolytes. There's like certain times that are bad. No, there's really not certain times that are bad and good. Um, Gatorade all performs water every time. Now, that doesn't mean that you necessarily drink the Gatorade that you get off the shelf. Um, there may actually be too much sugar and too much, too many electrolytes in a bottle of Gatorade so you can dilute down the water. But because you are sweating during exercise, part of the sweat that you're producing is a solution of salt. You lick your sweat and kind of salt. Not that I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> so you're losing salt. And where's that salt coming from? Well, if it's coming out of the plasma, it's being pulled out of the interstitial fluid. If it's being pulled out of the interstitial fluid, it's probably coming out of the extra, uh, out of the intracellular fluid as well. So we want to make sure that we replace that and replenish that. Okay? So, yeah, sodium and potassium. I mean, obviously water is really good thermal regulator and so to help maintain a lower core body temperature it's good to have water but Gatorade is water plus sugars and other so it's it's okay to have a sports drink that's diluted some water is okay as well if you come back and eat something that has some 
I guess I'm right now giving you the permission if you go out and exercise a lot on a daily basis, drink water during exercise and go and have a nice big plate of french fries. Because you're going to need the sodium and potassium. You need to replace that. You need to make sure that, that, those, uh, that those nutrients are coming back into your diet. Good question. Um, okay, so if water balance and electrolyte balance are inseparable, and understanding how both of those two entities of water and electrolytes move is going to be important. And this is what we're going to use as a, a starting point or a springboard for fluid balance. So you could look at water balance. You could look at electrolyte balance, or you can combine the two, and we'll call it fluid balance. To understand fluid balance, um, we basically know where the fluids are distributed now, but I'll tell you that they're constantly fluctuating. They're constantly changing. So what accounts for the losses that occur, and what accounts for the gains? On a daily basis, to be in fluid balance and to maintain that, to maintain that homeostatic variable, what is gained should equal what is lost. So your gains and your losses should be at an equilibrium. So the average human... has about 2,500 milliliters per day of gain and 2,500 milliliters per day lost. So you're going to consume 2,500 milliliters and you're going to lose 2,500 milliliters. So where do the gains come from and where do the losses come from? So in terms of water, the gains come from two sources. The first source is what's known as metabolic water. So what exactly is metabolic water? Well, metabolic water, and these numbers are pretty loose. I mean, it depends on who you're reading, but we'll say about 200 milliliters per day. So we're trying to get up to how much? 2,500 milliliters. So of that 2,500 milliliters, 200 milliliters is this thing called metabolic water. Metabolic water is going to be formed in the organism. So formed, I'm going to say, in vivo, Latin for in the body, metabolically. So it's going to come from reactions. <clears throat> Hopefully you're somewhat aware now that we have a series of metabolic reactions that help to maintain life in the cell that are called dehydration synthesis reactions. We have many dehydration synthesis reactions that occur <clears throat> in a metabolic process known as aerobic or could also be referred to as cellular respiration. You are undergoing a large amount of aerobic, aerobic respiration right now. Every time you breathe oxygen in, it gets transported into cells that are maintaining your heart, your brain, your digestive system, your liver, your kidneys, all of your tissues. That oxygen is used at the very end of the, uh, of the series of reactions. And there, <clears throat> there are 10 through glycolysis, 8 through the Krebs cycle, and then what's going on in the mitochondria with the electron transport chain. The very last step there is to take electrons and to add them to water. Whenever you take electrons and add them to water, I'm sorry, electrons and add them to oxygen, what do you get? You get water. So the kind of whole summary here of where this preformed water comes from, 
you consume in your diet things that either start out as C6H1206, which is glucose, or that will get converted into glucose and then can continue through the metabolic pathway. Glucose in the presence of oxygen is always going to result in the production of carbon dioxide and water. And this is our preformed, or I'm sorry, our metabolically formed water. About 200 milliliters per day comes out of this chemical reaction, running this chemical reaction to maintain your normal physiology. By the way, this right here, that's a marshmallow. That's one of the places that you'll have a bunch of sugar. And if I put a marshmallow right here on the table, it's being exposed to oxygen. The chemical reaction that occurs there is not quick enough for us to really notice anything, but this chemical reaction is actually occurring at that mouth marshmallow right now sitting in your pantry at home. It's combining with oxygen and it's generating carbon dioxide and it's generating water, but it's happening so slowly that you don't see any perceptible buildup of CO2 or water. Then you take that marshmallow, put it on the end of the stick, put it over a fire, that heat increases the rate of reaction, allows glucose to combine with oxygen at a much higher rate because you've gotten over the activation of energy and now you're beginning to produce CO2 and uh, molecules of water. And that marshmallow, what does it do? It begins to disappear as the CO2 floats off and the heated water vapor floats off. If it does, yeah, it's good by itself. You can come back and have set your marshmallow on the table. You can come back and have a nice s'more about six fingers.